You call women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account only is Rosie several... O'Donnell. Is maternity leave, according to you, a racket? Well, do men get maternity leave, Megan? I, I yeah. can't believe I'm asking you this. Guess what, honey? They do. Yes, they do. It's called the Family really? Medical Leave really? Act. If men would like to take right. three months off to go take care of their newborn baby, they can. Is this just math that you do as a Republican to make yourself feel better, or is this real? Oh, did you catch that? Did you catch that right there? That was it. That was the moment. making a completely valid point. I don't, it was about Libya, but she was expressing herself appropriately. And you said, calm down. And as you proved at the beginning of the segment, you have a penchant for that term. When I say that to, it's a unisex term. It, I tell Beckel to calm down. No matter who you and say it to, it's patronizing. Oh, it's patronizing. And you know what? Well, wait, 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 wait. Special connotation when yeah. a man says it to a woman on top of that. Right I'm not defending her. I am Richard defending her right to offer her views as someone who Likewise. underwent so what she underwent. I'm so glad Rich invited her. I'm no, you're glad. not. You're being sarcastic. That glad. woman has a right to offer her opinion. No. When you undergo yes. genital mutilation, you may have a thing or two to say about it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Katie Couric. And I'm Megan Kelly. So, <laughs> it's great to be here. We are your anchors tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm very excited to be here to talk to Megan about this extraordinary, I guess that's one way to put it, right? Year that you've had. Let's talk about that tape. When you watch that, do you think, geez, where did I get like the moxie, the chutzpah, the cojones <laughs> to uh, punch back in that way? Uh, no, because I come from a long line of strong women. There was one time we did a segment on how uh, spanking makes your kids more aggressive. And my mom used to spank us. So I had her call in as a phoner. And we played all these clips of me acting like that. And she said, it was behavior like that that made me spank you. Like, <laughs> it's chicken in the egg. So, <laughs> you, and, and I'm curious as I, I've watched you conduct interviews, I know you were a corporate lawyer uh, practicing law yep. before you pursued a career in broadcast journalism. And how did that, that experience help you with your current job? A lot. I imagine you, you can be pretty prosecutorial. It helped a lot because I grew up in the first nine years in Syracuse, the rest in Albany, in a small town with no connections to power at all. So my dad was a college professor and my mom was a nurse at the Albany Veterans Hospital. And you know, we never, we, we spent our summers at the town park. We didn't do the country club thing. We didn't know any lawmakers. We didn't have anything resembling the life I'm leading now with connections to people who are powerful. So I had no history of dealing with people like that. And it wasn't until I graduated from law school and started practicing law deposing Fortune 500 CEOs, defending Fortune 500 CEOs, cross-examining people in federal court, that I it initially had to fake it till I made it. You know, like, you gotta do it. You can't, they're, they're paying you a lot of money and you can't be some shrinking violet. And then if you do it enough times, it becomes more natural and you feel more comfortable really pressing. But I'm, surely your parents gave you a lot of self-confidence and kind of delivered the message as you were growing up that you could be anything you wanted to be, that you, could pursue any career. And, and I think a lot of us who have daughters and people who want to have children one day and raise their daughters right and empower them would like to hear sort of what message did your mom and dad send to you that enabled you to do this? You are going to laugh because it, it's probably exactly the opposite of the one you're anticipating. My parents were basically expecting me to be a cheerleader, I think, forever, because that was the only thing in which I had any interest when I was in high school. My mom used to say, they, they don't give scholarships for cheerleading, Megan. They, in fact, did, but not for the kind of cheerleading I did. <laughs> I, I still can't even do a cartwheel. Um, so I didn't really take myself seriously as an academic student uh, until I got into college and decided I wanted to go to law school. But my parents never sort of said, you're great, and you're smart, and you can do it. They, they did two things. They showed me that they believed in me, 
and they also insulted me. <laughs> That's great parenting advice <laughs> for all of you out there. I, truly, I remember saying to my mom, Mom, am, am I like really smart? And she said, no, nah, you're about average. <laughs> and I never grew up thinking I was the bee's knees, ever. Maybe I, that's the secret because there's so many entitled kids out there I'm now. I'm telling who, you. Everybody's yes. a winner, you know? You were definitely not necessarily a winner in my house. And not only that, what I think it did for me was it, it gave me the greatest gift, which is self-awareness. I never grew up thinking everything I did was awesome. But if I did something that was good, I believed the praise because it was so infrequent. Um, <laughs> But, but the, the criticism, it, I never felt that moved by it, like, oh, God, I'm bad, or I was a very unattractive child. My parents used to say, she's going to be with us for a long time. <laughs> and I was like, that's great, I love them. This is terrific. <laughs> I, it's like, it didn't bother me, because when I did something well, they would say that too. And, and just by showing, just one example, I love this example. My dad used to submit these, these proposals to go all over the world. He, he was an education professor, and he wanted to get grants so he could go to places like Indonesia and Africa to look at these education systems and offer his thoughts on them. So he let me read this one proposal he submitted. It was 100 pages long. I was nine years old, and he said, would you take a look at this? And I, every third word I didn't understand. And I, I, I sat there, I read it with my dictionary, I gave it back to him, and he wound up dedicating it to me. And it, it read on the front, this is from my daughter, Megan, who read this and said, this is good, Dad. <laughs> it, it meant so much to me. It's like, I, if I have one piece of advice, it would be just show, don't tell your kids. Like, let them see that you actually believe in them. And don't, do not give them a bunch of false praise. I don't think that's the way. Well, uh, talk about the opposite of false praise. Let's talk about Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I mean, Megan and I talked, and she said, this isn't, the whole thing isn't going to be about Donald Trump, is it? But of course we have to talk about him, Megan, because this has been one of the strangest campaigns in presidential history. And you've been at the epicenter of this. And I'm just wondering, you've not only, you're not only covering the news, but you're, you are the news. Has that made you uncomfortable? It must be such a surreal experience. You know a thing about this, because you did a, a very famous interview with Sarah Palin in which you were the news after that happened. <laughs> right? A little bit. <laughs> Not really. <but. laughs> um, it is bizarre. It's surreal. It's, it's very strange to sort of see the headlines come in, because we all get our headlines you know, from our team and just on our alerts and our iPhones, and to see yourself, like your, your own name, over and over and over and over and over. Uh, and that, it's a bizarre place to be, and it's not a place I want to be, and I'm looking forward to that ending. Well, well you know, I, we're not going to spend the entire time, even though Donald Trump would like us to spend the entire time talking about him, but I'm just curious about the debate. Um, when you asked that question, which I thought was completely legitimate, appropriate, well-researched question, but you, it was your first one out of the gate. And did you think to yourself, you know, I want to destabilize him a little bit. I want to start this debate with a little fireworks or sizzle. And tell me just sort of your thought process behind doing that particular question. No, uh, that wasn't what I was thinking. If you, if you go back and you look at that opening round we did with those guys, it was the very first debate of the entire season. And Fox News was in a great opportunity because we had that one. And these guys were, in some instances, unknown. That first round was on electability. Are you electable? If you get this nomination, could you be the presumptive uh, Democratic nominee, which we assume is going to be Hillary Clinton at, this point, at that point? And um, all of them got hit. They were, they were really tough questions for each one of them. I mean, the, the other guy I had was Ben Carson. I had to do Carson and Trump, and at the last minute I had Kasich. But the, the question for Carson was just, you know, it was like basically like, you, you've screwed so many things up. Listen to all these things you've said that are wrong. How could you possibly be the president? Right? And then Kasich got this question about his St. Peter principle. It was like, really? And then all the other guys got, I mean, Scott Walker, I had a really tough abortion question to him. So they all got it right in the kisser, basically. But Trump was the only one who complained. Well, he did he ever. I mean, uh, since that time, he's called you overrated, sick, unwatchable. He said you have a second-rate show, you're a third-rate talent. And I think that he's opened the floodgates for a whole array of vitriol from his supporters. I know that sometimes 
I think after that debate, Megan, I looked at the Twitter reaction, and it was, it was grotesque, I would say. How, how have you dealt with that, that kind of onslaught of, of just nastiness, which is so, I think, disheartening, disheartening because it says so much about us as a nation? You know, I try to stay off Twitter. Um, I have to go on the news feed, you know, so I go on the news feed, but I don't, I don't go to the mentions where, you know, you see what people are saying about you, and whenever I do, I regret doing it. Um, you can block people really easily. I'm going to show you how to do that. I, I found <laughs> another function on there, which is mute. Do you oh, know yeah. about mute? mute? I prefer blocking over muting myself because really I don't want message. them. To, yeah. It's like, I want you to know that I'm not going to see any of your tweets. Yeah. I, just, I want you to know. <laughs> so I... You know, I'm not going to say that it hasn't bothered me. It, it has bothered me, and um, you know, at times it's gotten very ugly. And I try to stay in my my happy, positive world, which is my husband Doug and my three children, who are two, four, and, and six. And you know, at times that's usually that's possible. At times when it reaches a fever pitch, it it spills over even into that world, and then it's in my head when I'm with them, which is what I really don't like. I don't like putting my kids to bed and having to think about that vitriol. But I also understand, to some extent, it's part of the job. And politics is a tough business, and news has gotten to be a very tough business. And I understand that you know, the people who love Donald Trump, not all of them, but many of them, feel that he was attacked, and therefore that they feel justified in then attacking me. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I, I think that's their mentality. What do you think f is fueling the anger that seems to be the, you know, really promoting the, this uh, support of Donald Trump among many people? I mean, I think he's surprised the media, he's surprised the political class with how well he's done. And, and what is fueling that anger? And really for people who are supporting Bernie Sanders as well, to some extent. Well, I do think that there's a, a whole section of you know, sort of working class people in the country who feel totally forgotten. And I've talked to some, some high-ranking Democrats who see that and Republicans who see that on both sides of the aisle. And they feel that the policies that have gotten pushed through in Washington or the politicians they've elected have gotten in there and then forgotten about them, have pushed policies that might help the elites or might help themselves, but really does nothing for the working class. And they feel like he is their advocate, you know, that for once, they have an advocate on both sides and, and speaks their language. I think one of the things about Trump and Sanders that is appealing is the way they speak. You know, two guys from Manhattan, right? Like, Trump is from Queens and Sanders is from Brooklyn. And the New York accent is very endearing. You got you to admit. It's, it's a very <laughs> endearing accent, I think. And just the way they talk is unusual. They don't sound like your typical politician. They're not that polished, and there's something appealing to it, and it makes you feel like, I can relate to that guy. That is a guy I've had dinner with. I can trust that guy. That guy's gonna look out for me. And I think a lot of these, you know, sort of working class people feel, that's how I talk. He's not gonna look down his nose at me. He gets me. He's not gonna judge me. And so what if he's not We've got some rough edges. I think he's going to go in there, he's going to fight for me. Well, I think authenticity is at such a premium now, and they both kind of exhibit authenticity in spades. And, and when you were going through all this, well, let me ask you, I wanted to ask you, what were your interactions like with Donald Trump prior to this debate? Did you have any kind of interaction with him or relationship at all? I did. I mean, I knew him a little, uh, the way you know anybody who you see in the news or who comes on your show occasionally. I think. When I had my afternoon show, he came on one time, and when I launched the, the Kelly File, which was the, like September of 13, uh, he came on one time. I think he was on the show twice before he ran for president. So I knew him a little bit, and then when we got closer to the election, or to him announcing that he was gonna run, um, he started reaching out more, and he started, he'd call me after a segment that he enjoyed and say how great it was, or he would send me, clippings uh, about myself, like news clippings and, like, that he would sign Donald Trump. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which was nice. I mean, it was nice. I, I, I appreciated that he was reaching out. There were some other gestures he made that, you know, in retrospect, I understand them better. I think he was, I think he was trying to curry favor because he understood that he was going to be running for president. At the time, I didn't know that uh, he was doing that with many journalists. Now I've talked to a lot of journalists. He was doing that with many of us. And I... 
he, he, I knew that I was never going to love him and I was never going to hate him. And it, it was no, no comment on Donald Trump. It was just, you have to keep these relationships at arm's length, especially when they're going to run for president. And there was, there was nothing to be gained from developing any sort of a friendship with him uh, or from alienating him. But I, I, my own belief is that when he got, heard that question from me, he felt betrayed. You know, that he had been, as he said, I've been very nice to you. Um, but it was, you know, I was like, I didn't ask him to call me or send me those nice, I, like, I appreciated that it was a nice gesture, but it's not gonna stop me from asking tough questions. You, I know that Fox issued a press release, <laughs> yeah. Fox issued a press release last month commenting, commenting on his extreme sick obsession with you. But, but before that, uh, before that, did you feel that they were being supportive enough publicly? And do you wish that your colleagues and sort of the, the executives at Fox had spoken out more on your behalf? Because even if they did this, they still had him on the show and they never, on their respective shows, and they never really challenged him about some of the things he was saying about you. You know, I think Fox has done a good job supporting me and I, I feel for my boss, Roger Ailes, because Think of the position he's been put in, right? This is unprecedented for a presidential candidate to go after a, a, a news anchor in this way. And so he, he has fought back and tried to issue statements and tried to contact him directly. And when Trump said he was gonna boycott the debate that he said he, he had agreed to show up, we spent you know, millions of dollars to get the facility and the RNC had agreed and the American people understood it was gonna be happening. The other candidates were there. And, and he said, I'm not showing up unless you pull her. And I think a lot of network bosses would have said, you're gone. Like, oh, come on, really? I do. I think that some people are so ratings driven, they would have found some reason to, to go to the moderator and say, what if you sit this one out? And I was grateful that my boss said, then don't come. She's, you don't get to tell us who the moderators of our debate are going to be. Because think about it, Katie, he had complained in some other instances about who was gonna be at some other debates, and those partners in the debates were pulled. So there is evidence that that kind of a pressure can have effect. Um, for the record, our debate was about 500,000 viewers lower than the debates that flanked it, and that's it. We still got 12.5 million, so it didn't hurt us too bad. Yeah. Um, but. The point is, they stood behind me. And I think that Fox is placed in a very difficult position because they have one of their lead news anchors under attack, and yet, what are they gonna do? They can't ban the presidential frontrunner on the Republican side from coming on the channel. Yeah, it has been very awkward and Nor should they ban him. Yeah. You know, the, the viewers wanna hear from him, I get that. You know, if we could just get to a place where like, he would stop saying all those things, <laughs> it'd be great. Let, let me ask you about the media in general. Uh, the New York Times reported that Donald Trump has gotten an estimated $1.9 billion in free media coverage. And Nick Kristof, a lot of people are now, there's a lot of hand-wringing going on among various members of the media. He wrote a column called My Shared Shame, The Media Helped Make Trump. And, and more than a few media executives have said, Donald Trump is good for business. Mm -hmm. Does that... Does that comment bother you? Is that really what journalism has come down to, pure business? It does bother me, and I don't think it's right. And I'll tell you what, early on in this election, it was June when Trump announced. Early July, I think it was, he went down to the Mexican border and did a presser from there. And it was fascinating TV. We put it on, on the Kelly file at nine o'clock, and we watched it, and it was the first sort of like, Oh my God, I can't take my eyes off of this. Like, what, what is he gonna say next? This is something so compelling about this. And we saw our numbers the next day and they had soared. And then he had another presser, not long thereafter. He said, let's, let's put that on. It was great television. We were, and again, I was like, look at this. I've never seen anything like this. What's happening? And we looked at the numbers the next day and they soared. And it was at that point, we're still in July. I said to my executive producers, this is long before the debate. It had nothing to do with any feelings I had about Donald Trump. I said to my executive producer, Tom Lowell, I said, this isn't right. And I said, I, I could see every, all the other media starting to do it. I said, when the postmortem is done on the coverage of Donald Trump, wherever this race goes, let's make sure we're on the side of the angels. And I, I am proud to tell you that our show 
has not taken those pressers, and it has nothing to do with what happened in the debate, even before the debate we had this policy. We have, we have not taken his campaign events wall to wall. We don't wallpaper the show with, with a Donald Trump campaign event. Why? Because we don't do that for the other candidates. So it's not fair. And it's not about, yes, we all have to worry about numbers to some extent. It's, that's, that's the reality of TV news in 2016. But we also have to worry about our souls and journalism. And in fact, I mean, I think equally disturbing, though, is this whole, t uh, I think, trend towards not asking super challenging questions. Because if you ask super challenging questions, the candidate gets mad, the candidate gets mad, he or she d won't be interviewed by you anymore. So it's all about access. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you feel as if people's hands were tied during certainly the beginning of this election cycle because they did not want to kill the goose that was laying the golden egg, as my father would say? I do, and I, I think it's so ironic because if everyone had stood up from the beginning and asked very tough questions, which is what we get paid to do, um, there wouldn't have been this issue because we would have all been shoulder to shoulder asking tough questions. So I wonder there, about you that though. Couldn't cut off access. You know, I wonder about that though. He has been such a Teflon candidate. He has said many outrageous things that would disqualify a lot of other candidates. Right. But I think the groundswell of support for him is so strong for whatever interesting reason that these some of his answers throughout the course of this campaign really haven't hurt him in his stand. No, I think that's true. But, that, but that's a different issue. What his answers are is for the voters to evaluate and make up their minds about. What the questions are is up to us. And I think... No, I agree. I agree. But I'm just saying I don't know if it would have made a big difference. I don't see. My, I don't look at it that way. I don't care whether it makes a difference or not. That's for the voters, right? Like our job is to just press. We're supposed to press. And what I have seen in the election is, and I, I, I wonder sometimes whether the question I asked him at the debate and the backlash against me has cowed other journalists because they don't want it to happen to them. Or maybe they don't have a boss who they think will stand behind them. Or maybe they just want access and they want the numbers. But what would have happened if they had gone a different route? What would have happened if everybody, and you're seeing a lot more of it now, mm -hmm. but what would have happened if in that moment everyone had gotten tough, really tough, equally on all of them, including him? And then y you can't, as a presidential candidate, shut down everybody. You, you can't shut down Fox and CNN and CBS and ABC and NBC, you can't. So it, there's strength in numbers on our side too. And this was a moment, this was an opportunity for solidarity among the press that I think we missed. Yeah, do you think that could have happened though? I just don't know. I think people are, it's so driven by the bottom line. I think it was sort of a race to who could sort of improve their ratings. And I, I, it would have been great, I agree but I don't know how realistic that would have been. And that, but that's one thing I do want to say, because now the journalists are sort of trying to defend themselves by saying, well, we asked Ted Cruz, and, and he doesn't say yes. We asked Donald Trump, and he says yes. Okay, that's fine when it comes to interviews. That doesn't explain all the phoners that the Sunday shows allowed Trump and not the other candidates. Phoners. Fox News Sunday, hosted by Chris Wallace, is the only Sunday show that from the beginning said, we're not doing that. If you want to come on this program, these are revered programs. You come into the studio, or we'll send a a satellite truck to you and we'll put you on camera, but we're not doing a phoner on the Sunday shows. They broke the rules only for Trump. And, and, and not only that, we're talking about the campaign events. Katie, when have you ever seen news stations take campaign events? For 90 minutes at times. Right, that's, we don't do that for anybody. We never did, we don't do that for Hillary, we don't do that for Bernie, we don't do that for Cruz. We never did it for Rubio or Scott Walker. Only one candidate. And then the media would sit there and say, it's amazing how the polls are just up, up, up. It's like, you're, you're putting your thumb on the scale. And, and so it's not, it's not an anti-Trump thing. It's just a responsibility as journalists, as journalists thing. And I, I think that we really need to have an honest self-assessment in the postmortem to figure out what, what we've done. It will be really interesting to see how journalism schools discuss this campaign, I think, in 10 years. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll be okay, but <laughs> I, I, if I were some of those other folks, I'm not sure I'd want to be around. What, so what, what have you learned from this whole experience, and, and where do you, what do you hope to do next? Because we only have a minute and 30 seconds left. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, hmm, what have I learned? 
Um, I guess that adversity is an opportunity, you know, for growth. And um, it also helps show you who your friends are and who you really love and who loves you. And, you know, I'll give you one example. My, my husband, Doug, is my best friend and has really gotten me through the whole year. But this is a different kind of example. There is a professor at Harvard by the name of David Cutler, who I used to have on the show during the Obamacare rollout. He was having so many problems, and he's one of the architects of Obamacare. And this is a liberal guy. He's coming on Fox News, and he's super smart. He's from Harvard. We always make fun of Harvard because, you know, we're jealous we didn't go there. Um, <laughs> and so it was I my safety school. <laughs> well, she's smart. She went no, to the University of Virginia. Anyway, so he was so sweet. He's sort of mild-mannered. Anyway, I used to have him on all the time. And when the, when the Trump thing happened, he sent me the, the sweetest email. Just, just said, it just read, I hope you're OK. Let me know if there's anything I can do. And I got a lot of these emails, don't get me wrong. But that one, for some reason, really stuck with me. It's like we didn't really know each other. Probably most people would have thought that we were you know, having a combative relationship, because I used to pound him on, why is it going so badly? Is this the death spiral? What's happening? What kind of law did you design? <laughs> and here he is, and he sends me this beautiful note. And it just, it does remind you that even though these events can bring out the worst in people, they can also bring out the best in people. Well, I hope you're getting a lot of support. Megan Kelly, Megan, thank you so much. Yeah.